Good morning, Valley Grace. Welcome. We're so glad you're here today and have decided to join us for worship. Um, and if you're joining us on the live stream, welcome. We're so glad you're here as well. Let's stand and worship together this morning.
Again, how about that? All right. 
Welcome to those of you who are joining also online. Um, some of you are watching now, some will be watching later, so um, we just uh, are grateful that you're able to do that also. I want to thank you for your financial investment of Valley Grace over 2022, and because of that, we've been able to uh, be invested within our own community, do ministry here, help people seek to follow Jesus, become followers of Jesus. Uh, when we make that decision, that's just the beginning, and then it goes on from that point that we grow in our relationship with Christ. We've been able to also be invested in our community. Thank you for those of you who purchased uh, gifts uh, for some needy families that we received through uh, the school system that say these are folks that have been screened that really need some help. Uh, we're also uh, able this past week, and thank you for those of you who helped out at a memorial service, and we had a dinner here, a lunch here uh, for that family. So thank you for that. Also, uh, we do encourage you uh, to pick up a handout, gives you some information that's taking place, what's uh, even coming this week, and as we move in that time of year, uh, where uh, weather can be a, sit a, a situation. In fact, uh, one of my feeds came up, and a year ago, uh, we had snow, so a couple weeks ago, we might as well have, right? You know, as cold as it was, and then we hit balmy summer, and we're back here. So there's some ways in which uh, you can find out as to what is taking place. Sometimes it might be we push the service back, or as possible, we may need to cancel it. Don't assume that just because where you live, uh, the roads are good. Sometimes uh, Gay Street is one of the last on the list, and so we don't want you slipping and sliding uh, into here, um, but maybe we'll do something online. We'll just have to figure that out, uh, but if you want to get a regular update, ask to be put on the Valley Grace email list. It's an opt-in, not an opt-out. We don't want to bombard you, so just because we have your email doesn't mean that... Uh, that you're going to get that. So ask, it would say, I'd like to be part of that. Uh, valleygrace.net, you can uh, uh, go to that website and ask. Uh, we are on Facebook as well. Um, and on valleygrace.net uh, is our website. There'll be a banner there saying, informing you uh, of what is uh, taking place. So I just wanted to uh, make, you, make you aware of that. Well, as we've had the privilege of singing and thinking through through song, there are many benefits of being a follower of Jesus, of having a personal relationship with God that comes through the person of Jesus Christ. Obviously, the greatest uh, part of that is uh, what is called eternal life that begins here and now when we acknowledge that we are sinners in need of a Savior, that we, are, we, are fail, we have failed in life and that we can't be good enough to get into God's heaven. And so when we acknowledge that and we look to the, what Jesus has done for us and that he paid for our sins and our failures and it's done, you see, that's one of the things about the Christian life that uh, changes it from all other religions. All other religions say you need to do. Uh, followers of Christ understand it's been done. It, the price has been paid for. And that's why when Jesus shouted in triumph from the cross, it wasn't a whimper of death. It was a shout of triumph. It stands finished. The tense that's used there has this concept of it's done now and it's done forever. And so the work of Jesus has been accomplished for you and me, and we, it's a gift. We have to accept it. We need to receive it, but we understand that it's done. It's been paid for. And so when we uh, accept that step and we, make, we take that step, we become part of God's family. It's another one of the fringe benefits, if we can use that terminology, that God becomes our Father through Christ. We are His children and as uh, we go through life, we experience the benefits of being part of the family of God, that God cares for us, that we can go to him and ask for wisdom in decision making, that we can talk to God in prayer. We can thank him for what he has accomplished and for what he has done. We can pray for our daily needs as Jesus instructed us, uh, as the disciples said, teach us to pray. And Jesus said, you pray for your daily needs, your daily food. We can seek his blessing on our endeavors. We can seek his leading in our life. And many times, God in his grace, when we ask for a, a particular thing, obviously it's not prayers and always just asking, it's being thankful. Uh, but when we ask for God, uh, oftentimes it's, uh, there's a yes. There's a yes. Uh, and sometimes there's a wait, just as any good parent would do with their children. And um, sometimes there's a no. None of us like no. I know when I was growing up, I didn't like no. I really liked yes. And if you have children, you understand that is, that is also true. 
And sometimes when we make a request of God, uh, maybe it's about a, attending a certain college, getting into a particular curriculum or college program, or maybe it's uh, a certain job that you are really desiring to be part of, or maybe it's a marriage partner that you are kind of thinking, that would be the person for me. And uh, so you begin praying about that. Uh, maybe it's because of a sickness that's taking place, or maybe it's a, a very serious sickness, and as a result of that, you are praying, and you've prayed long and hard, and the answer is a no. It's not a wait, but it's a no. Frankly, I've experienced this in my own life. As a young boy, I was enamored with airplanes and flying, and I thought that was the direction that uh, I really wanted to go. And so in college, I signed on as a line tech at the local airport because they promised me that if I did that, one of the fringe benefits would be reduced cost of learning to fly, of earning my private pilot's license. And so I began that process and uh, got the hours that I needed. And actually, my solo cross country was out of Warsaw, Indiana, their big metropolis airport, not into a Muskegon, Michigan. Came in over the water, it was a beautiful flight up, coming down, hit weather, coming back, followed railroad tracks so that I could end up where I needed to be. Anyway, the promise, you know, sometimes those things that are promised to you don't really turn out like you thought they would, and so some of the promises of the airport weren't really turning out, and so I realized that I was not able to earn, I didn't have enough funds to pursue my own private pilot's license. And so I began to look at a number of different ways in order to do that, and God seemed to keep closing doors. But I keep coming up with options. You may have closed that one, but how about this one? And then that's a no. And how about this one? And that was a no. And I had enough uh, biblical knowledge my parents had taught me that, you know, there are some times when God says no, it's best to leave it at no. Because there are stories in the Bible in which there are individuals who went to God and forced their way. And God said, all right, I'll give you what you want. And it was a disaster. One of the ironic things is my younger brother uh, started out after me, became a commercial pilot. And in fact, he, he signed my flight log book. Uh, we went up a number of years ago flying and Don says, here, I'll sign for you. That at least it'll give you another hour You'll never get it. But no, he didn't say that. I just understood that. And so it was a no. And then God, and I don't think it was a facetious thing, then God stationed us, uh, put us in Dayton, Ohio. And if you know anything about Dayton, Ohio, right? Patterson Air Force Base is there. And every time an airplane went over, I had to stop and look up. You know, all different kinds that are going over. And on one particular day, it's like, man, that's a weird noise. I look up, and here's a 747 hauling the space shuttle back from uh, California, because remember, they used to land there, taking it back down to Florida so it could start off again. Again, it wasn't that God was being facetious or sadistic or taunting. It was just, it was just, just. Well, this morning, we come to look at this story, a true story of a man who loved God, and asked to be able to do something that he felt was really a contribution to the Lord's work. And, and it would be a demonstration that he loved God and his thankfulness for what God had done in his life. And God gave him a definite no. And so how do we respond when God gives us no's in our lives? I invite you to grab a Bible, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. We'll be looking at Verses 1 through 7 will be on the screen, but if you want to follow along in a Bible, it maybe is in a chair rack in front of you. It's page 323. Page 323, 2 Samuel, chapter 1, verse 1 through 17. I want to set the background for this for just a little bit because it is really important. And so the setting of what takes place of this no for King David uh, and, uh, is found, the setting is found in verses 1 through 5. And so we read this, beginning in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1. It came about when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest on every side from all of his enemies. We need to back up for just a little bit. Some of you are joining us maybe for a while. And, and David has been on the run for his life for probably 13 to 15 years. Uh, he was anointed to be king uh, as a teenager, 
maybe 15 years of age, and uh, Saul, who was the king on the throne at that time, realized that David was not from his line, was not from his dynasty, and he understood that David was going to be king. And so he has been pursuing David for about 15 years. When David finally gets to the throne, he's 30 years of age. And so he's been running from Saul, who is seeking to kill him. David's been hiding in caves. He's been even in enemy territory. He was with the Philistines. He's been in enemy territory. He's been fighting battles. It, it, he's always been looking over his shoulder because the enemy is always behind him, whether it's Saul or the Philistines or somebody else. He's been running for his life. And every time, he, sometimes living in a cave. And now we read he finally has rest. Years of running, and it's now peaceful. For some of you maybe who are involved in farming, a, a little bit of a similarity. I mean, you push really, really hard uh, for harvest to get everything in before winter comes. And there's, then there's a sign. I get it. It's not all over because now it's time to fix the equipment so you can go out and plant in spring. I get that. But, but that push and there's, uh, to get everything done, to get it in before the wet, winter weather comes and there's a chance to take, take a deep breath. And in a sense, that's what David is, is finding himself here. It's a peaceful time. Finally, there's peace. It's also a thoughtful time. You find that in verse 2. That the, so the king David said to Nathan, Nathan's the prophet. The first time we're introduced to Nathan, he'll show up again in this book. See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the Lord dwells within a tent curtains. Uh, ark of, uh, living in a house of cedar was, was living in a very expensive house. In, in Palestine, there wasn't a lot of lumber. Uh, most of the houses that were made out of adobe and, and, and stone and that kind of thing, uh, wood had to be imported for the most part. And so living in a house of cedar was living in an expensive house. It wasn't wrong. It wasn't bad. What David is acknowledging is that finally God has allowed me to be in a place where I have uh, rest and I'm, I'm, I'm not in a cave. I'm not in a cave. And so he's contemplating. And, and what we notice here is that David does not become complacent. You see, it's easy for us at times when things all of a sudden, the, the pressure is off to become complacent. And when we become complacent, it becomes dangerous. And we'll see that later on in David's life. But here David now is thinking through, and he, he has a chance. He's not running anymore, and he's thinking through, what is it that I can do just to demonstrate my appreciation, my love for God, my relationship with God? I'm not earning anything with God. God's already done it. But how can I demonstrate that I am grateful? He says the Ark of, of the Covenant. If you remember a little bit that, that God had instituted, he had designed that there was to be this Ark and you know, this isn't the same as Raiders of the Lost Ark, so um, there's not a lot of similarity there. Uh, but it was a two-foot by two-foot box by about four feet uh, long. And in it was, you, what, what was in it? Do you remember? All right, I think we heard them all. Uh, with, uh, a copy of the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that budded when he was before uh, Pharaoh, um, and, and then also the, um, a jar of manna as they were taken across uh, the, the wilderness, the desert. And so this ark became a demo. And on top, this is really important. On top of the ark was the mercy seat. And that is, was a demonstration of God's presence among the people. Mercy seat. You don't earn it, but it's a mercy seat. It was in between two angels, cherubim, that were on top of the ark. And so that became a demonstration of God's presence. God isn't limited to some two foot by two foot by four foot box, nor is he limited to a, a tabernacle that they would, it was like a tent that they would take with them as they moved because they were transient across the desert. They've now moved into the promised land and they have this, this tabernacle still there and the ark is still there and Pastor Doug referenced, they finally got it back to Jerusalem last week. And David's thinking, you know, I'm living in a paneled house. I, I'm in a really good place, but the ark of God, which is a demonstration of God's presence among us, is still in a tent. And that doesn't seem right. And so what he does is um, he says to Nathan, who's the prophet, who's supposed to be the spokesperson for God, and you find that and, uh, and says, here's what I want to do. Verse 2, I, you know, God still dwells in this house. The ark is in this house. So I'd like to build him 
a, a, a permanent place, a permanent building. We would call it a temple. And verse 3, Nathan said to him, to the king, go do all that's in your heart for the, the Lord is with you. Now, now we find a little bit of problem here and we'll find it even advanced in the next verses is Nathan never really consulted God. Now he's supposed to be a spokesperson for God, but he never consults God. But it sounds good. You know, build, build, a, build a temple sounds good. God, you know, that would be nice. That, that makes a lot of sense. So he tells David, go, go ahead and do it. Well, God gives him a no in verses 4 and 5. And it came about in the same night, the <laughs> same night that Nathan has said, yeah, go do it. Nathan's gone back home, we assume. And he's, in the same night, it came about that the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, go and say to my servant David, uh, there's a sense of urgency that we find in this. It's like, get up now. Uh, you know, don't wait till daybreak. Go now. And I can imagine, you know, if you're using your imagination a bit, that uh, Nathan says, well, if God says go now, now's probably a good time to go. And so he goes uh, to, to David's house, knocks on the door, and whoever's the guard there, so who's this and what do you want? Well, I've got a word to you from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, verse 5, are you the one who should build me a house and dwell in, for me to dwell in? Now, it's a question with the anticipated answer, no. Now, there are some things that stand out to me in this particular section. And that is the importance that we consult God before we begin the process. Things may make a lot of sense to us. In fact, we may go to somebody who say, you know, they're, they're, they're a spokesperson for God. They walk closely with the Lord. I'm going to go and get some counsel from them. I'm not sure what I ought to do here, but I'm going to go get some counsel from them. Dear friends, the way that God speaks to us today is through his word, is through scripture, is through the Bible. And so if there's anything that contradicts what God has given to us in the Bible, it is contrary to God's blessing. The Bible is not one of those archaic books. It's an amazing book. It was written by 40 plus different authors. The authors lived within a time frame of 1,400 years. There are 66 books that are in this particular book. Hence, we have the word Bible book, what we call the Older Testament and the New Testament. And, and it all fits together. In fact, we'll see some of that. Some of the prophecies, Old Testament, that we find in the New Testament that were filled 700 years later or more. That God tells us that this is his word. This is how he has chosen to communicate with us. That's why we open our Bibles on a Sunday morning. That's why we encourage you to bring your Bibles. You can mark in them. There's nothing irreligious. Oh, there's something I need to put in there. If you don't have a Bible, we'd be happy to give you one. It's the guidebook for life. It's the owner's manual that came with the world. And so it's very important if you're, you know, if you're looking for a church home, do they open their Bibles? And so here, Nathan never took the time to seek any information from God and found out that the counsel that he gave to David was wrong. So we open our Bibles together. We open our Bibles during the week personally because we want to hear from God. How does God want me to handle this situation? It's amazing what we find covered in the Bible. You know, why, where we came from, why we're here and where we're headed and how do we have a relationship with God and, 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 and what is marriage and what is parenting and, and how am I to relate at work? And there's so... Huh, Proverbs, how do I guard my tongue? Whew. And the dangers of not. So there's, there's, a, there's tremendous truth. And this is not a suggestion. When the world around us contradicts, it's not God who's wrong. It stood the test of time. And so we open our Bibles. It's one of the things we read in the New Testament about the Bereans is uh, that uh, when Paul, the Apostle Paul would preach, they would go home and they would check him out. They would open up, they had the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament. They had the Old Testament to say, is, is what he's telling us true? This is the Apostle Paul. And Paul commended them. So when you leave here this morning, you go back and say, did Dan tell the truth about this? So that's the setting. 
Why did God say no? Verses 6 to 11. Uh, Really, it was a a not now or it's not for you. Um, God doesn't always give reasons why he chooses to say no to us, but but ultimately in, in the pages of Scripture, we do find out the reason no. But it's interesting also that God God uses questions to help David think through, which is also a good thing for parents in parenting. Instead of, you know, yes, when children are young and they can't, you know, put it all together, sometimes no, it's just got to be because I said so. But as they get older, it's, well, what about this and what about that? And have you thought about this? And where do you think that's going to take you? It takes a lot more time to do that, but we understand that's that's important parenting, helping them to understand. That's what God does. And so in verses 6 and 7, God God asks a question, For I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought you up uh, from the land of Egypt, even to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent, even in a tabernacle. And wherever I have gone with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word which one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd my people, Why have you not built me a house? In other words, God said, you know, I've I've never really asked you to do that yet. I've never really said, you know, why aren't aren't you taking, why haven't you built me a permanent place? I find it interesting, the word, the the idea in here is it says that even in a tabernacle, a tabernacle, again, was the evidence that God was among them. And the word tabernacled means that God is dwelling among us. And that was the neat thing that God was doing to the Israelite nation as they're moving across the wilderness there for 40 years and and the tabernacle was there. It was the center of the camp. It was a representation that God was in their midst, that God was among them. It was evidence of God's presence. You see, God stooped down to share in our hardships. Friends, that's the story of the coming of Christ, the incarnation. We just recently celebrated what we refer to as Christmas. That Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, came down to tabernacle to live among us. He took on human form. He came as a helpless baby. It may sound sacrilegious, but it's true. He needed his swaddling clothes changed. He needed to be fed. The creator of the universe arrived through a human mother. And he grew in wisdom and he grew in stature and he grew in favor with God and man. He knew what it was like to live at home very possibly knew what it's like to lose a dad because after about 12 years of age, we find no other story about Joseph, his earthly father. He learned a trade. He was a carpenter. He was a builder. And then at 30 years of age, he begins his earthly ministry, teaching individuals who he was and what he had come to do. He enjoyed the times among his friends out on the hillside. He also knew what it was to be rejected, to be spit upon, to die the most cruel death that was possible. And you see at times in our lives when we were saying, man, God, I wish you knew what it was like to live down here. He said, I know what it's like. Jesus came. He tabernacled. He lived among us. So God stoops down to share in our hardship. And actually a reason that's not given in this particular section, but we find it in 1 Chronicles, God says, the reason, David, why I don't want you to build this house for me is because you're a man of war, you're a soldier. I want this to be built by a man of peace, which will be your son Solomon. Because I want my house, my temple, to be known as a place of peace. Then God, we go on in verses 8 through 11. We need to understand that when God says no to us, he's not rejecting us. It's not a rejection of David. And when God says no to you, it's not a rejection of you. We often take it that way, don't we? 
And so in verse 8, we see that God's purpose. And so God says this, Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture from following sheep that you should be ruler over my people Israel. I, David, I'm not rejecting you. I, I took you out as a, from being a shepherd on a hillside and, and I anointed you as king so that you would sit on this throne. I'm not rejecting you. And then David, I've been with you wherever you've gone. First part of verse 9, I've been with you wherever you've gone and I've cut off all your enemies. So his, God's presence never leaves us. As followers of Christ, I, Jesus said, I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. God brought protection. He cut off his enemies. You see that again in verse 9. And then God's grace in verses, uh, last part of verse 9 on to verse 11. I'm going to make you a name. You don't deserve this. You were a shepherd, but it's grace. I don't owe it to you, but it's grace. I'll appoint a place for you, verse 10 and 11. I'll appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may live in their own land and not be disturbed again, nor will they be wicked, afflict them any uh, more formally, even from the day that I have commanded judges to be over my people. I will give you rest from all your enemies. That land is the land of Israel. And we read in, and we understand from history, May 14, 1948, Israel became a nation. That's a promise. And I say, well, they don't live in peace and prosperity right now. No, that's future yet. It's called the millennium. It's going to happen just as prophecies of the past. But many will look at the fact that Israel is still in existence when they are surrounded by enemies who have said, I'm, we're going to push you out into the sea because they've got enemies around them and the Mediterranean Sea and the fact is that they have been protected by God. Go back and read about the Six-Day War. Incredible. God's fulfilling His promise. They're a nation. Not ultimately what they will be one day, but they have a land. It was brought on by the Second World War in which they said, never again, never again. We want a place that we can call home. So in verse 11, this is reference to the millennium, middle of that. I'm going to cut off your enemies. And then God's grace, last part of verse, verse uh, 9. I'm going to put you there like with, with great men. I'll appoint this place. I'll make you rest from your enemies. And it's, it's interesting, verse 11, I, I will make you a house and a dynasty. I will give you a dynasty. Where at the very beginning, David says, God, I want to build you a house. God says, no, no, no. I'll build you a house, a dynasty. That dynasty is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And so we see that God keeps his promises in verses 12 through 16, which are reminders to us as followers of Jesus, if we placed our faith and trust in him, that God keeps his promises to us. And so first of all, we see that death does not break God's promises. Look at verse 12. And when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up from your descendants after you. You will come forth from you and I will establish this kingdom. Verse 13. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of the kingdom forever. And we look right now and we say, so, but we don't see anybody sitting on the throne of Jerusalem, sitting on that throne. The answer is absolutely but Isaiah tells us that off of that stump of Jesse, who is David's father, there's going to come this shoot. That shoot is a person of Jesus Christ. That is why the beginning chapters of Matthew and Luke are so important that trace the genealogy of both Joseph and Mary back to David. You see, these are not just haphazard things that are thrown together so that Jesus is of the tribe and lineage of Judah. He traces his kingdom all the way back to David. For us as followers of Christ, we are reminded that the death does not break God's promises. Jesus, as he was standing at the graveside of Mary and Martha, who had just buried their brother Lazarus, Jesus said this, the one who believes in me will live even if he dies. 
Eternal life begins here and now when we place our faith and trust in Jesus and it goes forever. Death does not break eternal life. It does not break our relationship with God. So God keeps, first of all, his promise that death doesn't doesn't break God's promise. Secondly, sin can't destroy it. Verses 14 and 15. I'll be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. And when he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed before you. You see, when we place our faith and trust in Christ, and even when we sin and fail in our failures in our life, God doesn't kick us out of his family. He's made a promise to us. He's made a promise that the one who has begun a good work and that God who has begun a good work in us will continue it on. That God is not surprised by our failures. It isn't like, well, if I knew Dan was going to mess up like that, I wouldn't have invited him into my family. It's like he knows all about that. It's not based on my goodness. It's based on a promise of Christ. And so God says, here's what I'll do. I'm not going to kick him out like I did Saul. Remember, Saul rejected God, so God rejected Saul. And that's why David then became king. New Testament tells us that those who are followers of Christ, those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. You see, discipline, and that can be positive and negative, is a demonstration of love. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Don't go that way. It's, It's disaster. Stop. And God does that for his people. You don't have to live very long and you experience the discipline of the Lord in our lives as followers of Christ. In fact, it goes on. If we don't experience God's discipline, we need to check to see if we're one of God's people. Because God doesn't discipline those who aren't his children. Just as you shouldn't discipline the kids of somebody else, you discipline your own children. So whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And you see this promise that God made to us of eternal life. We sang about that very first song. That God disciplines us, but he doesn't kick us out of his family. So the first is death does not break God's promise. Secondly, sin can't destroy God's promise. Thirdly, time will not exhaust God's promise found in verse 16. That God's promise to us has no expiration date. And so verse 16, and your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever and your throne shall be established forever. That's looking future. That's looking at Jesus who is of the lineage as I mentioned of David that in, during the millennial period, thousand year rule and reign of Christ from Jerusalem that God's promise is not exhausted which is also a reminder to us that he who believes in me, Jesus said, will have eternal life. If there's no expiration, there's no expiration. If you put your faith and trust in the person of Jesus, the promises of God are valid. I want to close with just a few thoughts, but before I do that, or as I do that, or uh, those of you who are preparing for baptism, um, if you would like to go ahead and get ready, those of you who are going to be reading, uh, you could just stay here, um, and, and we'll... So some concluding thoughts. When God does not respond as we want, it's interesting, the word that's used for loving kindness in verse 15. The loving kindness, David, I'm not going to, to, to quit in my loving kindness to you as I did towards Saul. It's a very special Hebrew word, is chesed. A loving kindness that, that demonstrates God's care and compassion that is true for you and me. That when God says no, it's not because he's angry at us. It's his loving kindness. You see, secondly, God doesn't call everybody to build temples. David was a soldier. That was what God had called him to do. And God calls you maybe as a business owner. Maybe he calls you as a person involved in educator, uh, as an educator. Maybe it's as one who is part of the trades, a plumber, a builder, electrician. 
Maybe it's a truck driver. Maybe it's medical. We don't know. But God calls each of us to a particular journey in life. And he wants to use you for a reason and for a purpose. There's a little piece, and it will come later, perhaps. And that's the fact that after God had told David no, that David said, all right, I will accept that. In fact, in the next uh, verses, 18 through 29, is a tremendous prayer of David reflecting on the faithfulness of God in his life. But David says this, all right, I don't get to be the builder, but I'll lay out the blueprint. I'll collect the building materials, the stone and the wood that's going to be necessary so that my son Solomon, who hasn't even been born yet, whoever comes next will be able to build this. I'll set aside the resources and get everything in place. I may not be allowed to build it, but I still see the faithfulness of God. I will not quit. And sometimes when God says no, it's really a redirection of our lives and it's an opportunity to trust him. We think we're headed this way and God says, no, I've got something else for you. But I wanted this college, no, I've got something else for you. But I wanted to marry this, no, I've got something else for you. It'll be worth it. It's a redirection as we place our, our, our lives in him and trust him. And that brings us back really kind of full circle that asks the question, have we trust the greatest promise of God, which is eternal life? Have you put your faith and trust in the person of Jesus? We're going to hear in just a few moments the story of some young people who have trusted Christ. They placed their faith and trust in Jesus. And so as a result of that, they have eternal life. And if you and I, as we place our faith and trust in Christ, we have eternal life. Starts here and now goes on forever. Why live life without Christ? It's acknowledging I need what Jesus has done for me. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, and that I've invited and accepted the gift that God has given. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the reality of Scripture. Thank you for the truths that you give to us. Thank you for lessons. Thank you for your faithfulness. Even at times when we aren't, you are. Thank you that we can trust our eternal destiny in your hands because you love us. You have a loving kindness for us. And we sang about the fact that Christ loved us so much that he came down into the world to be our Savior. And so, Lord, we are grateful for that. I pray now as uh, we observe uh, the stories and testimonies of some young people, um, Father, that we are encouraged through that as well, considering our own lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When someone decides to follow Christ, their life is changed forever. Death turns to life. Despair changes to hope. Dark becomes light. It's a deep, quiet moment that could easily be kept hidden. But a change this profound can't stay a secret for long. It's time for the world to see what God has done. For we were once in darkness, but now we are light in the Lord. Baptism is an act of faith. It's a celebration, a beacon cutting through the fog, a message to the world that a lost cause has been redeemed, that God is here, and he is transforming lives. So embrace this moment. Declare his glory. And let your light shine. We have the privilege this morning of <clears throat> watching four young people be baptized. But I want to give you, again, just a little background <clears throat> on, uh, on why we do it, how we do it, uh, those kinds of things. One of the things that you uh, <clears throat> need to make sure you understand right away is that baptism has never saved anybody. 
these four folks have already professed their faith in Christ. They're already believers. They're coming as an act of obedience. There's also some, a lot of symbolism in the way we do it. So if you haven't seen it before, <clears throat> here's the symbolism briefly. If you have seen it, this will be review. You're going to see three motions. We believe that that is uh, what the Lord indicated in the end of Matthew chapter 28. There's a symbolism of the involvement of the Trinity. So in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit. There's some symbolism there also about going into <clears throat> the baptistry. Uh, the symbolism of death to our old life and resurrection to the new life. So when they come out of the water, out of the baptistry, there's that symbolism. We have a rare privilege also of seeing three dads and one grandma baptizing this morning. You can search everywhere in the scripture and it never tells you who is the one who's supposed to be the baptizing. So often it's a pastor. It doesn't have to be. These are people who have played a real spiritual influence in the life of these folks. We saw that last week with Skylar baptizing his sister. And so <clears throat> it is great that uh, dads are involved in uh, the lives of their kids uh, more than just take them to events, but involved spiritually as well. And it's great that a grandma is involved also. So <clears throat> I'm supposed to kind of keep talking until... <laughs> until they're down there and ready. <clears throat> so uh, the four that you're going to see, uh, they're going to be giving a testimony, and in that they'll kind of uh, explain who they are. Um, <clears throat> and again, three of these are dads, and uh, one is Grandma Margaret Kane. If you haven't met Margaret, she normally sits right about over in that area right there. Also, if you are one who is praying or reading, if you can come to here, we have lights that uh, pick up better for the camera. <clears throat> they stand for you and Jason knows that this is the mic we're going to use so I think Meg at some point you're praying yep and Kelly you're doing something so yeah if you can come over to here that'd be fine okay <clears throat> are they coming up here or where are they going to start to go down there who for prayer oh right here okay. all right can you all see probably not I'll give you that opportunity is your mic still on I don't know am I on no yes maybe All right, to begin with, uh, yeah, I'm on. We want, we want to inter kind of introduce you to the players here, give you the script so that you know who is doing what. Uh, this morning, Isaiah Shank uh, is going to be baptized. Uh, his mother, Kelly, uh, will be reading his story or his testimony. Uh, Brandon, his father, will be baptizing him, and then Kelly will have uh, closing prayer. So, Kelly, please. I'm super excited to go first. Um, okay. Hi, my name is Isaiah Shank. I am 12 years old. I am being baptized today because I believe that um, Jesus died on the cross for my sins and failures so that I may one day join him in heaven. Dude, you knew what you were getting. Um, <laughs> um, I come from a family of Christians. My parents and sisters have all been baptized and are still continuing their walk with God. A lot of Christians have had a moment in their lives where they started believing in God right away. I have believed in God since I could understand who he was. Through my life, my understanding and knowledge of Christ has grown. It has especially become strong in the past two years through Sunday sermons and Wednesday night church. Pastor Dan has explained how to live and how to grow in God. In Ephesians 5, 2, it says, And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. I've learned how to handle different situations and how to respond to them in a way that would please God. Pastor Doug has helped me on Wednesday nights to know why to choose God. Ephesians 4, 25 says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are members of one body. Sometimes people question believing in God, and if Christianity is true at all. I think that it is true because there is evidence. For example, 
when people are hiking and find seashells at 10,000 feet above sea level, it is because of Noah's flood. Mm -hmm. Or when archaeologists find ancient writings about Jesus, this just proves to me that God and the events of the Bible are real. I am getting baptized today because I believe that God will cleanse me of my sins and failures so I may start a new life in Christ. Isaiah, because you've asked Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior, placing your faith and trust in him, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And now, if you'll join me in prayer. Dear God, I want to just thank you for the opportunity to witness Isaiah's baptism and to share and celebrate in his decision as a believer. Um, it, it, just we all in this room just sit here in awe of your holiness and your sovereignty over every aspect of this world. But just at the same time, you have this simultaneous concern for each and every one of us, including Isaiah. Um, we thank you for showing up in ways that just speak to Isaiah and influence him in nature and the time he spends outside and his questioning and, and wisdom and the people throughout his life. Um, we ask you to continue to challenge Isaiah, to help him grow in curiosity and desire and seek you know, your truth in his life. We pray for Isaiah's growth and the growth of his influence on the people around him. And God, we just ask you to help each of us pursue your will for our individual lives with just this unquenchable passion for your truth and your goodness and your purpose for each of us. Amen. Amen. While we're getting ready, <clears throat> if, if you would hold the applause till after the prayer, it, it's great celebrating. So don't, don't do the, just wait, wait till after prayer, just make it a little smooth. Um, Ivy Osborne would like uh, to be able to share with you the fact that she's become a follower of Jesus. Her testimony is going to be read by her older sister, Autumn. She's going to be baptized by her father. And then uh, Meg Wagner, who has been involved in girls' ministries, uh, we'll, have a, we'll have prayer for her. Hi, everyone. My name is Ivy Osborne, and I've been a believer for some time now. I've grown up in a Christian home and been going to Valley Grace all my life. Even though my parents have taught me to follow Christ, I still have to follow him in my own time. This summer, I went to a Christian camp with one of my close friends, and it really influenced me. There were so many times that week that I felt like Jesus Christ was sitting with me when we were singing praise songs into the night or having our Bible studies. As I've gotten to be almost a teenager, I feel like Jesus has spoken to me, like always, but this time I truly listen with happy tears filling my eyes. I feel my relationship with Jesus strengthening every day as I've gone through tough, time and tough things in my life. Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This verse has helped me to realize that God cares about me so much and that I never have to worry about him forsaking me. And Jesus has helped me through every single hard time. I have chosen to be baptized at this time in my life because I have felt the closest with Jesus right now through Girls of Grace, my own prayer time, my own Bible studies, my camp, and so many other things. Before, I was nervous about getting baptized, but now I have no doubts. Ivy, because of your faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for such an amazing day. Thank you for the, this gift to hear how you're working in the lives of these young people. Thank you now for Ivy, for her desire to be obedient in following you. 
You have created Ivy with a kind spirit and a heart bent on loving you. So I pray, Lord, that you continue to grow her faith and her relationship with you. I pray for Chuck and Erica that you give them wisdom as parents to help guide and direct Ivy. I pray for her grandparents and her siblings and her family and friends that we can help encourage and support Ivy's growth in knowing and loving you more. Because Ivy has grown up in this church and heard the gospel preached her entire life, I pray that great news never becomes old. That Jesus, loving her so much that he gave his life for hers, ignites a flame inside her that never fades. I ask, Lord, that when this life gets hard and the valleys come, that she will find your hope and your peace and trust in your promises that never fail. Thank you, Lord, for being such a good God, for knowing us, seeing us, and hearing us, even when we may think it's quiet. Continue to amaze Ivy with just how awesome you are and give her your boldness to share this great gift with others. I pray even in this moment that hearts are softened and that these testimonies impact someone's journey. Thank you, Lord, for this special day, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Kyla Bielek Gordon uh, would like to share her story with you of how she came to know Christ. Uh, her testimony is going to be read by her mother, Kelly. Uh, her grandmother, Margaret, came. It will be baptizing her, and then Kelly uh, will have the closing prayer. So, Kelly, if you'd like to come up and read her story, that would be great. To know Jesus by reading my junior Bible with my Mimi and my mom. When I learned to read myself, I would read to Mimi, my dolls, and my stuffed animals. Some of my favorite stories are David and Goliath, Samson, and the story of Adam and Eve. These stories and others have taught me that Jesus is real, that he came to earth to die for my sins. Because I believe in him and what he says is true, I look forward to spending eternity in heaven with him. Amen. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I love Jesus. I love him with all my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength, just like he tells us in Mark 12.30-31. you trust in Jesus and he is your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Dear God, thank you for gathering us here today in celebration of Kyla's love and devotion to you. May you continue with grace and kindness to support and protect her along her path with love, courage, and confidence in her faith with you. Amen. Amen. Sarah Strickland comes this morning also to share with you that she has become a follower of Jesus. She is going to read her own story. 
Uh, she's going to be baptized by her father, uh, Ben, and Ben will have prayer for her. Go ahead, Sarah. My name is Sarah Strickland. Most of you already know me. I started going to this church seven years ago, and ever since then, all of you have helped me to grow into the young Christian woman that I am today. And I am proud to call you all my Christian family. 2019 was my first year going to Momentum, and the first day of Momentum was the day I was saved. The speaker explained what Jesus had to go through on the cross, and I remember something clicked in me. I wanted to know more, and that's when I truly started my Christian life with Christ. I've wanted to be baptized for almost two years now, but now I'm proud that I'm doing it for the right reason, for Christ and myself. I'm too tall. <laughs> Sarah, because you've expressed the faith in Jesus Christ, <clears throat> and knowledge of his word, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father God, what a blessed day, what a privilege and an honor it is to be here and witness, um, to witness all these young people dedicating their lives to you, making this public profession. Father, for my daughter especially, and for all of these young people, we pray for grace, for without grace we have no hope. We thank you for the blood of Christ, which takes away our sins. We thank you for your word that explains everything that we're to know about you and your love. And Father, we thank you for this Christian family. And Father, we ask that, uh, I ask that you bless my daughter and her walk with you, that she would know you more every day. And as for all these people here today, that no one would leave this building without knowing you, without understanding your love and your sacrifice for us, Lord. And we thank you, as always, for Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'd like to close in prayer. Father, what a great day it's been uh, just to hear stories of young people who have come to know who Jesus is and what he's done for them. And Lord, I, I pray that as uh, they go from here, we realize this is just part of the continuing journey, that there will be many things that come through life. We pray that they might stay close to you. We pray for their parents, uh, Father, that as they seek to lead them uh, in your truth, we're grateful for parents who desire to do that. We pray for grandparents and other family members who do that. Lord, thanks for this uh, church family who's invested in the lives of these young people and others. Uh, God, may we walk with you carefully. May we show what it means to know Christ as our Savior and, and to tell that great story that there was such a love for us while we were opposed to you that Jesus came and that's why he came. And so thank you for this day, and we again entrust these young people into your care. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for being with us. You're dismissed.